Now it's time to hear the stories of Utes in their own words. This is Utes Insider presented by Pepsi. Here's your host, Mike Legaschult. Hello again, everyone, and welcome to the show. Utes Insider presented by Pepsi and University of Utah Health. Thank you so much for joining us. And I tell you what, football fans, we are almost here. We are finally ready for some football. November 7th, Utah against Arizona to start things at Rice Echo Stadium. And we've done our best on this podcast to keep the football talk going throughout the spring, summer, and fall months. And before we have our first official game, I want to bring on one more football guest for you. Steve Tate, who was an all-conference safety for the use from 05 until 07, will join us today. Great playing career for Steve. Uh, 100 tackles his last two years in 06 and 07. He was so instrumental in helping Cal Winningham lay the foundation for this program in his early days as the head coach. And, of course, we all know what happened after that. The Utes went to the Sugar Bowl, went undefeated in 08. They won back-to-back Pac-12 South Division titles in 18 and 19. But guys like Steve really helped get this program going under Kyle Winningham. But as great as he was as a player, the the work he and his wife Savannah have done in the community is so much more important. Back on March 12th of 2015, they welcomed triplets into the world. At that point, six kids in the family, they brought in Heath, Reese, and Hayes. And unfortunately for them, on January 7th, 2016, less than a year after the triplets were born, one of them, Hayes, had a tumor taking up one-third of his brain. After six rounds of chemo, a stem cell transplant, Hayes went into remission for six months. They were to miss it, but in November of 16, the cancer returned, and Hayes passed away December 3rd, 2016. And we all know how tough it is to have loss, to go through adversity, but what Steve and his wife Savannah have done uh, has been remarkable. They started the Hayes Tough Foundation it's dedicated to providing financial support and hope to families affected by childhood cancer. And on top of that support, the foundation is trying to raise awareness to help fund research as well for childhood cancer. It, it's amazing how underfunded childhood cancer is compared to some other pediatric diseases. But Steve and his wife, Savannah, doing great work. So Steve will come on and talk about the foundation, talk about his career. He'll talk about what players are going through. He'll kind of put himself in the position of, of players in this climate, what they've been through. And also, he's in a unique spot. He registered in 04 with the Utah football team and went to the Fiesta Bowl. And he played with that core group that won the Sugar Bowl in 08. So I'm going to ask Steve, which was the better team, the 04 Utes or the 08 Utes? Should be a good conversation. All conversation. Steve Tate coming up in just a moment. Back after this. To hear more episodes of this show and other Utah Athletics podcasts, search for them on iTunes, Spotify, and YouTube. Now, back to more of Utes Insider presented by Pepsi. Well, so happy to be joined by a former all-conference safety for the Utes from 2005 until 2007. He works down the financial industry, has the Hayes Tough Foundation with his family, and he's not a bad sideline reporter for football either if you, if you need someone to do that for you. Steve Tate, uh, just a great guy who I got to know during my days on the football broadcasts and as he wrapped up his career, and, and we'll get into his background before Utah, during his Utah career, and what he's doing now. So, Steve, appreciate you hopping on the Utes Insider podcast. Well, hey, uh, thanks for having me. Thanks for thinking of me. Uh, my my time as sideline reporter was short lived, and they they kind of demoted me to the to the high school game. But you know, I'll take it. I'll take it. <laughs> you did a great job, I thought. And and Sharif Shah at that time was still working as a lawyer and, and had some some tough weekends where he couldn't get free to come and join us. And he did a great job. And I tell you what, you're just like me. You put up with Frank Dolchik, and it, it can be it can be <laughs> difficult. And you you handled it well. But we had a lot of fun then. It was a chance for me to get to know you a little bit more as as you you uh, finish your playing career, but. You know, Steve, I want to kind of go into a bunch of topics. I mentioned the Hayes Tough Foundation in honor of your your son Hayes, who died of childhood cancer. Your family's done a great job with that. But I want to go back really to even your pre-Utah days and and talk about your high school career. I mean, you were, people maybe don't know, an outstanding All-State quarterback at Skyline High School before you switched to the defensive side. Uh, 5A MVP in 2000, the state's Mr. Football. You led the state in rushing yards and rushing touchdowns and had a great high school career. So let's go back to that, Steve, as your starting point. Yeah. You were a guy who was very talented in high school. I know how it works for guys who play quarterback in high school, want to have a chance in college. And sometimes a school like Utah says, hey, you can come, but you're coming as a defensive player. And, and guys want to give it a chance to still play offense. So when it came down to deciding where you were going to college, was Utah involved? And, and what was their talk to you initially before you ended up going to Utah State? Yeah, you know, um, 
it's it's funny and looking back now you know leading the the, the state in rushing yards and rushing touchdowns and here i was a quarterback uh you know at the time your 18 year old 19 year old self thinks that uh you know you're you're destined to play quarterback and of course you got the pride and you want to prove people wrong but the reality was i think i had like 600 yards passing on the total you know for the season which you know now <laughs> you're seeing you're seeing teams like american fork have that in one game but right um yeah i mean i i i just i love the position uh I, I love playing offense you know i had a passion for it and i felt like i could do it um you know, and then it, it took kind of that recruiting process for me to understand where, where teams saw me. Uh, I mean, a lot of the teams that kind of were recruiting me were, were kind of pegging me as an athlete, you know, was it slot receiver? Was it quarterback? Was it defensive back? Um, you know, when I ultimately, when it came down to Utah, Utah state, um, you know, I, I kind of had mixed messages of where I, where I would, would play at Utah. Um, you know, I had, Coach McBride telling me he wanted me kind of playing the slot, perhaps the slot receiver. Uh, and then Coach Whittingham said, no, you're a safety. I want you as a safety. And then I kind of just uh, more than anything was, was just uncertain where I, where I, you know, laid in their eyes. And, mm-hmm. uh, you know, as a recruit 18 year old, it's hard to kind of put your trust in, you know, the situation like that. And Utah state kind of gave me, showed me the love early on. Uh, I never really envisioned myself going to Utah state. I was always kind of a Utah you know, fan growing up and that's where I always wanted to be. And they ultimately told me I, I, I could play quarterback and they, you know, they, they offered me as a quarterback and, uh, and you know, that was something that uh, I obviously valued. I wanted to at least have a chance to play quarterback and they were willing to do that. So that's, you know, that was kind of the recruiting process. And of course I get to Utah state and, you know, you, you know, you, uh, you know where you fit when they hand you number 27. So, you know, <laughs> right. They, they hand me number 27. <laughs> Not quite the quarterback, uh, number I was expecting. Yeah. Was it 12 or 10 or 14, right? <laughs> exactly. It could have been a little more discreet about right. it, but, uh, you know, when I went up there, uh, they, they were thin at safety. Uh, they knew I was an athlete. The, the, the quarterback was a returning starter. So there was probably very high likelihood that I would red shirt. And I, I didn't want a red shirt. You know, I wanted to go and play and, and prove my worth right away before I left on my mission. And so, uh, you know, fortunately I was able to go and start and, you know, I was a good true freshman and get a little, some great experience. And, uh, and then I left, of course, on, I've been left on my mission, but, you know, between the two processes, I <clears throat> always had a great respect for Utah, for coach Whittingham, uh, you know, coach Whittingham was pretty bl- blunt about it. He said, no way in hell you're playing quarterback at Utah. You're, you're safety. Yeah. And, uh, and I, and I respect that, you know, I respected the honesty and I respect that he, he saw that in me. And so, uh, you know, my, kind of my parting words when I, you know, committed to Utah state and, and, uh, and decided to tell Utah that I was moving on. I, I told coach Witt that, you know, if things changed from a you know, coaching personnel standpoint and there was a, you know, a new coach and, you know, he wanted to, uh, think about bringing me on, I'd, I'd be open to, you know, further discussions, but, uh, you know, that's kind of how we left it. And I never thought that uh, just a year out into my mission that things would change. And, uh, sure enough, they did. And they sure did. Uh, Ron McBride was, was dismissed and a guy named Urban Meyer came on board and, and really changed the face of the Utah football program while you were on your mission. So before I get into your transfer to Utah, you know, you see a lot of guys, Steve, who play quarterback in high school. They also play some safety or some linebacker. But the fact that they played quarterback and they just learned to think through the game, through the eyes of a quarterback and the mind of a quarterback helps them on defense. As a guy who played so much quarterback in high school, how did that help you transition and become such a good safety at the college level? You know, um, yeah, I think, I think the, you know, the leadership mentality, uh, being able to read, you know, offenses uh, helps you certainly, you know, um, my, my junior year, I played safety, uh, and, and I got, you know, it's kind of one of those things where my junior year at Skyline, I started on that team as a safety. Um, and Skyline didn't really believe in playing kid playing kids both ways. Right. You know, they were kind of a two platoon system. And so, um, my senior year, it was basically, you're playing quarterback. I got, I got some reps at safety during, you know, some uh, harder opponents, but, I didn't get a, a a lot of playing time as safety in my senior year because of playing quarterback. So, you know, Stanford, um, you know, I kind of fell off some of the radars because of that position change. Uh, Stanford was high on me my my junior year, and then switching to quarterback, you know, kind of kind of changed things and altered it a little bit. Wow. Um, 
Yeah. And, and it was one of those things where, you know, you didn't, you know, you wouldn't expect it, but, uh, you know, back then I think, uh, you know, more film on uh, a, a certain position would have been helpful, but, you know, fortunately Utah, you know, Utah saw that in me. Um, you know, they, they saw that ability to, to make that switch. And I don't think, you know, again, I think things have changed now. Uh, very few quarterbacks now with the way quarterbacks are, could probably make that switch to safety. I think quarterbacks now are just kind of your, you know, most quarterbacks are just your pocket passers and having them making them switch to defense would be probably a lot harder than, you know, quarterbacks when I played that were running the football and playing in a, you know, I was, I was playing in a system where I was getting hit quite a bit. And so contact to me was, was welcomed. I, you know, I was, I, I was, I was physical. So that allowed me to make the transition a lot easier. Um, if I wasn't used to contact, if I wasn't physical, I don't think I could have done that. And so ultimately I think that helped me as well. Just, you know, being, being in that system, running the wishbone, uh, getting hit basically every play, um, uh, taking shots. I think it just, you know, allowed me to, you know, switch over to defense and, and, and really be able to excel early on and, and not have a long transition. I, I think I was able to move, you know, like I said, at Utah state, be able to, make that move and, and then switch to safety. And it was kind of seamless. It only took, you know, uh, basically one fall camp and then I was ready to start my, my freshman year. Yeah. It worked out pretty well for you. Visiting with Steve Tate, former all conference safety for the Utes on Utes insider presented by Pepsi, grab a Pepsi and some friends and get in the game. Pepsi proud partner of university of Utah athletics. All right, Steve. So you go to Utah state to start your career. You play there in 2001, you head out on your mission from, 02 to 04, and as we said a few moments ago, things changed with the Utah program in that stretch. Urban Meyer came on board. Kyle Whittingham was retained as the defensive coordinator and would later on take over as head coach. But you're on your mission before you come to Utah in 2004. So tell us about the decision to go to Utah, the conversations that were had, and and how you ended up being a Ute in 2004 as a redshirt. Yeah, it was it – was, uh... I was excited. Of course, I wanted to play for Utah. Um, you know, making that switch was, was hard though. In, in some regards, I had to, you know, the, the, the one criteria that, you know, urban presented was look, you're coming in midway through the year, our scholarship counts aren't there and you're going to have to, you know, you're going to have to come in as a walk on. And, uh, and so I was giving up a scholarship to Utah state to go be, you know, a walk on. And, and, you know, at the time, I wasn't your typical walk on because it was, it was more of a numbers situation with me. It was, it was just that they didn't have the numbers um, and they weren't planning on me enrolling in, in January. So, you know, I kind of got pegged as a, as a walk on and, you know, when you, you know, there's a big difference between scholarship player and, and walk ons and they're treated different. Uh, they're looked at different uh, teammates view you differently. You know, in my belief, I still think the coaches you view you a little differently and, and so I kind of got pegged as, as a walk on and it was, it was kind of a tough pill to swallow, but you know, I, it, it, I think ultimately made me stronger, made me work harder, made me want to prove people wrong. And, um, so it, it was good. I mean, the transition, I remember showing up, uh, and, and we're doing match reels at the time. Now match reels, uh, that's what we refer to them as the five thirty wake up calls. And at the time, this was right before the indoor facility was, was there, was getting built, but we were in the bubble. And we were on that Astro turf and it was five 30 in the morning. And I was, I was like three weeks off my mission. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, I mean, and, and I remember urban, you know, it was total different, uh, total different way of coaching than what I was used to at Utah state. Uh, you know, we, we show, we show up and he lined us up and he telling us to wrestle. I mean, it was just full on free for all <laughs> wrestling. I mean, I'm just at that point, I'm thinking, I don't know if I'm suited for this. I mean, this yeah. Is, I'm, I'm like two weeks again, I'm two weeks removed from being in a foreign country in, in Argentina. I've got, you know, my legs, scrawny legs. I'm starting to doubt myself. I'm this walk on and, you know, it, it was, it was tough, uh, you know, having to earn the respect of, of my teammates and not really fitting in. And, you know, I had to go through this huge kind of growing process where they didn't care if I was Mr. Football. Nobody really cared. You know, nobody cared that I started Utah state. It was, you know, what are you doing now? And, uh, I wasn't, I, no longer was I kind of the big fish in the small pond. It was, I was having to earn my, earn my way around. In fact, I laugh, Eric, Eric Weddle and I were best friends. And, uh, but at the time I was, I was trying to get my legs back underneath me. And I was on this, I was on this workout with a, a bunch of other teammates. And, uh, 
and I'm just pumping with everything I've got. I've got no stamina. I've got, you know, nothing to it. My, my legs are weak and they're just cruising along the guys next to me and urban era and, and Eric comes up and someone says, Hey, this is, this, this is Steve Tate, Mr. Football. And Eric looks at me as I'm just like in sweat and I'm trying panting. He's like, <laughs> you were Mr. You were Mr. Football, you know, totally yeah. like you know, shunning me. And then, uh, <laughs> And then he says, is your bike harder than the others? And it was just this moment where I'm like, I, I hate this guy. And, you know, we, we laugh about it now, but it, yeah. it, it was one of those moments where it was like, it, I just felt like I had to prove everyone wrong. You know, I had to prove myself. Uh, you know, I, I remember looking up at Bo Nagahi, who was my former teammate. He was a captain on the team. And, you know, just trying to be like, look, you know, Bo and, and seeing him up there and knowing that Bo was Mr. Football before I was and, you know, just trying to believe in myself that I, that's what I wanted. And, uh, and that, you know, if I worked hard, I could not only, you know, earn a scholar, get my scholarship, but be a captain and starter. And so it took a, it took a lot of kind of uh, believing in myself and, and, and trying to motivate myself. And my, I had just, you know, I was married right after my mission and my wife believed in me, but it was, you know, it's certainly a process that, that red shirt year coming back off my mission and, and, you know, trying to earn the respect of my coaches, my teammates. Yeah, I've heard a lot of stories about the transition from Ron McBride to Urban Meyer as Urban came in in 2003, and his philosophy was, hey, I want to find out who wants to be here, and he would just put guys in the gym or in the indoor facility and and run them and and really test their mettle and, and, and just find out, again, who was committed and who wasn't, and the results speak for themselves. Ten wins in 03, that magical run in 04 with the Fiesta Bowl championship and a 12-0 record. So you registered that 04 season, and you were around that group, and I'll talk to you more about that 04 team in a bit. But 05 was a chance for you to get the play, and I want to talk to you about that transition because – Listen, Utah football had some good years under Ronnie Mack, but the Urban My years were special, winning 22 games in two years. But people kind of wondered, hey, can Utah continue this? You know, Kyle Winning has been there a long time. Everyone felt he was the guy for the job. He was a long-term hire who they thought would stick with the program and has. But there were questions about where does Utah go from this magical two-year run under Urban? You were a part of that transition process and and got a chance to play and be around that staff and, and that group of people during the 05, 06, 07 years, which were so critical to get things started for for Coach Witt. What was that transition like in terms of you know players? Did you kind of wonder, hey, can we can we keep this magic going from 04? Did it seem like a fresh start? Was it a continuation? Just sort of what were yeah. kind of the themes and, and the thought processes going on amongst the players in the program at that time? Yeah, I mean, I think there was. I mean, there, there was a uh, there was a you know uh, obvious difference in, in coaching philosophies and 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 the style changed a little bit. You know, I think we were all trying to figure it all out. You know, I think Coach Whittingham was as well. You know, he yeah. was he was he was filling in for a guy who in two years you know took this program from you know, a respectable, but from a respectable program in, in the mountain West to a, you know, a top five program. And, you know, that's a, that's, a, that's a huge thing to be able to have, you know, do that have to step into and you lose your quarterback, you lose a lot of your starters. So we, we were in a rebuilding you know, phase. And I think, you know, the, I think the winning mentality never, never, you know, faltered, but, uh, you know, I, I think to, to ask a coach to step in and be as dominant as we were under urban, uh, was, was, it was a tall task. And so, you know, I think our expectations, perhaps the fans expectations were that we were going to do it and there was going to be no, no setbacks. And that just wasn't, you know, wasn't the case of, uh, as, you know, as we saw, we had, we struggled, uh, throughout that year a little bit. Um, and, you know, but it was, it was good. I mean, it was, it, it, you know, guys found, uh, found, you know, opportunities to play. And that's where I, you know, 2005, um, you know, my first opportunity came against Air Force in 2005, you know, for, fortunately for us against Air Force, they, we, we ran three safeties. And so, you know, I was able to start that game against Air Force and, um, you know, we ended up winning that game and, uh, you know, I was able to be successful in that and show myself and show my work. And, um, you know, we had some skids along, along the way, but again, uh, I think that's where it was a growing process. It was a reflection, you know, where we all kind of said, okay, you know, ultimately no job is safe. And, you know, some kids could handle that. Some starters couldn't, you know, there was kids that actually transferred out of the program that year that were starters under urban. And a lot of it was because, you know, coach Whittingham basically said, you know, no position is safe and we're going to have competition throughout the year. And, 
kids, the people that want to compete are going to earn their spot. And, you know, that's, that's really where I earned my spot. I ended up, you know, starting you know, the, the later half of that year at all yeah, at safety. And that's when they moved Weddle back to corner. Um, you know, that's, that's kind of one of those things where uh, people don't realize that when, when people talk about Eric uh, playing, playing safety, you know, one of the things they don't realize is he was actually, he only played uh, corner for his, uh, he only played safety his uh, for 2005, just a you know few games. I think five games into 2005, and the rest he played as a as a corner. Yeah. And when I when I went and earned that starting spot, you know the the bit mentality there was we're going to get the best eleven on the field wherever that may be. And so you know when I was able to prove myself, uh, they they slid they slid me into that that uh, free safety position and moved Weddle, Weddle over to corner, which. I think helped him, it helped our team. I mean, it helped our pass defense as well. So, you know, that 2005, 2006, 2007 were, were, you know, certainly growing years, but I think we started getting things rolling in, in 2007, which obviously uh, led for uh, a great 2008 season, but you could tell there was a, you know, there was certainly a transitional period for the program in 2005, 2006. Busy with Steve Tate on Utes Insider brought to you by University of Utah Health with 16 convenient Neighborhood Health Centers, we have a game plan for your family's health. Visit uofuhealth.org. You know, Steve, I want to talk to you about those 05 and 06 seasons. I mean, everyone knows what happened in 08 with the Sugar Bowl run, but, you know, I think early on the question was, hey, is is this program able to continue that momentum from 04 as we talked about? And at one point in 2005, the team is is 3-4, and four, and they had given up 31, 21, 28 points to Carolina, Colorado State, San Diego State, they got the big win at BYU to go to bowl game, which was critical that first year in 05. And then in 06, the team at one point was was four and four. They had a humbling loss to Boise State in Salt Lake, 33 to or 36 to three. They also lost to Wyoming and New Mexico. So there were some tough stretches those first two years under Coach Witt. Steve, do you remember a point where it was maybe something the, the players said or talked about or the coaches said or talked about that maybe really galvanized those groups together and got things turned around and helped us get to that magical run in 08. Is there, is there a moment or two where you thought, okay, we've turned a corner here with this thing a little bit? Yeah. I mean, I, I think in the, we, you know, yeah. Looking back, man, that you mentioned that, that Boise state game, yeah. I think I had 17, I think I had 17 official tackles, but I was looking back on the film it was 23 unofficial tackles in that oh my game. gosh yeah career high I mean, 17 was, for you officially you're right but <laughs> was it 17 official yeah yep. that, that's funny yeah, i think <laughs> it was 22 unofficial when you watch film yeah um i don't i don't know if there's a specific turning point i think you know i think the problem again we had injuries as well that 2005 year was was a special year with with ratliff coming in right. and uh you know no one expecting us to go down to beat BYU. i think we were 17 point underdogs going down to to play byu in provo um, and yet here we have Ratliff coming in, has n- no experience. You know, he's a, he's a JC transfer, a guy who, uh, who actually replaced Aaron Rodgers at, uh, at the JC before Aaron Rodgers went to, to Cal. And right. so we didn't know a lot about Ratliff and he came in and just, you know, just owned it and, uh, played exceptionally well and, you know, led us into that 2006 year. Um, you know, in 2006, you know, we had, we had that Boise state game. I think the turning point again probably led into 2007. Uh, we had just beaten, you know, a, a, a top ranked, a top ten, I think, or they may have been eleven. I don't know UCLA, but it was a top ten team in UCLA, and we, we just crushed them. Right. And uh, and then the next week we lay an egg against you know being. I think that was it. That was that was really the turning point uh, for our program. Uh, you know, you could you could talk about the loss to BYU. Uh, you know, when they beat us the last second with the, that Johnny Harleen catch. Uh, certainly, that one's done in 2006. But I think where where we changed, and where we really just basically uh, after that UNLV game, you know, we had a players only meeting 2007, and it was basically like you know this is you know we can go two ways from here. And at the seniors, especially at that time, I was the captain and you're always looking over your shoulder and wondering like, what are the coaches going to do? Are they going to have a youth movement here where, you know, if we don't step up and start, you know, consistently winning these games and, and uh, you know, uh, and, and meeting these expectations, are they going to go and play the freshman and all of a sudden your positions out the door? I mean, you don't know. And so I think, you know, we had a players only meeting, right after that, you know, the game. Uh, and I think that was really that, that kind of flipped the switch, um, you know, that with the exception of that BYU game, 
man, we were on a roll and we were beating good teams. We beat Louisville on the road. So I, I think that was probably the turning point for the entire program. Those are really good memories of, of that run. And, and I remember talking to Coach Whittingham in the spring of 07. He said, hey, listen, we have a chance to be good this year, but in, in 08 is really where this team can really be special. But you had to get there first, and you're right. You know, I'm thinking about 05 and 06, but really the 07 season got off to a rough start. Brian Johnson, Matt out of Seattle were hurt in that Oregon State game on the road yeah. in Corvallis. And you're right, that team was 1-3. Four games in, they had the great win at home against UCLA, who was a top 15 team, but a 27 nothing loss in Las Vegas. And at that point, from what you said, that's where it really turned. And talk about the stretch run in 2007. Again, winning those seven straight games, you go eight and one to finish up the season. As a team turned a corner, what was it like being a part of that group, kind of seeing this thing come together and knowing, hey, they, they've got a, a really good core here that could be good for a couple of years. We, we did. We suffered. I mean, Matt Asiata, that, that loss against or- in Oregon State, that Oregon State game, that hurt us. And, uh, you know, it was, it was trying to fill that spot at, at uh, you know, that running back spot. And you know, it was a defense, too, that was having to replace Casey Evans and, and Eric Weddle. And I was the returning starter. He had Bryce McCain back there. But we were, you know, having to replace some guys, uh, and and Robert Johnson came in as a JC transfer, and yep. uh, he ended up coming in that uh, that UNLV game was his first start. They moved me down to strong safety, and they moved him to free safety, which I was probably you know more suited to be a strong safety because I was a blitzer and you know led the team in tackles, so it it, it probably better suited me. And certainly with Robert, uh, you know, Robert was your free safety prototypical free safety you know he was not one to come down in the box and hit necessarily he was he was the one that was going to go play that free safety position and go you know make some interceptions and he had a you know a, a great year you know one thing people don't uh, realize is that that 2007 uh our past defense was number one ended up being number one in the country that year and so you know i think we took pride in in uh in kind of rising up playing good defense and and you knew kind of going into that that uh that defense was 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 special and you know we had we had figured things out and uh and Bryce McCain who was only I think at the junior at the time you know I was a senior um and I was I was the guy that was you know basically they had to replace me as the safety that year but you know it was it was stemming up for a really potential good senior year for you know Robert Johnson and Bryce McCain um and brian johnson and and, and robert there is i mean it, it, it stevenson sylvester i mean kind of things were aligned for those guys because of the experience that they went through and you know again i think they had also a lot of those guys that experienced the the 2006 and 2005 season where you know things weren't easy and and so uh they had experienced you know some of those losses and but they had started to see the turnaround in 2007 as well. And I think, uh, I think that's that momentum really carried them into 2008. Yeah. He makes some really good points. It was really the process of 05, 06 to 07 that those guys went through to make that 08 season happen the way it did with an undefeated record and, and not letting up and understanding the importance of every single game. You know, as you look back and, and it was unfortunate for you, Steve, you were one of the few guys from the 07 team that didn't stick around for away because you were done, but you had a really nice career. I mean, three bowl games, three wins in bowl games, 05, 06, and 07. You end up first team all conference in 2007, 103 tackles that year for you, three picks, and that team won the Poinsettia Bowl over Navy. As you look back at your three years playing for the Utes, what are some games, some moments that stand out to you? It could be some moments in the locker room or practice with the guys, but as you look back at your three-year run, what what moments and, and games stand out to you the most? Oh man, there's so many. Um, I would, I would say, you know, just hanging out with the guys. I mean, those, those, those moments were special. Uh, the BYU games, of course, that, that 2005 game was special going down there, uh, you know, just trying to pump up Ratliff. I remember, you know, I hadn't, hadn't even had many conversations with, with Brett up until that point, you know, Brian was the guy and, and, uh, you know, Brett was kind of recruited to be a backup and you never expected him to come in and, and all of a sudden he comes in in New Mexico and almost wins that game for us. And, you know, all week I'm just telling Brett, like, Hey, this is, this is a big deal. Like this game could solidify you in Utah. Like, you know, you, you could become a God in, in Utah football history with this, with this win. And, you know, just trying to school him up on that and leading up to that game. And, uh, you know, just the doubting that was going on and watching the news and hearing, you know, how good BYU was and, uh, you, I, you know, and then nobody expected Brett, but Brett Ratliff to come in and, and have, 
you know, hundred yards rushing and over a hundred yards passing and ended that, you know, us beating them in overtime. You now that was certainly a special game. Um, the one that will always stick out, you know, for me playing in that rivalry was, uh, something I always dreamed of. Um, and then that first game starting in it, uh, coming away with a win in Provo was, was something I've always, you know, dreamed about doing. And so that, that was, that was a fun one. I mean, I look back on, on so many of those games, my, uh, you know, one of my favorite was that 2005 after that game was, uh, going and playing Georgia tech and yeah. playing Calvin Johnson. And again, it was kind of that nobody expected us to be there. I think, you know, they, they played the card that, uh, they didn't want to go play Utah and the, they were a top 25 team and they felt like they got shunned a little bit playing against us or whatever. And, you know, going and playing them and, uh, Reggie ball had all the hype that year. And, um, you know, I ended up getting my first interception and led the team, I think, in tackles at that point that or in that Emerald Bowl. So that was a yep. you know, that was a fun that was a fun game, one that kind of put me on the radar, so to speak, with you know, uh, with you know, leading up to my senior year of being able to be all conference. And yeah, I think that those those were special years, even though it was two thousand five, uh, you know, ending on those high notes, uh really, you know, were were positive takeaways and and uh fun memories that that led into two thousand six. And you know, I Again, the things you miss most are, you know, hanging out with the boys. We we would, you know, we had safety night, which is funny. We so every Thursday night was safety night, and uh, and we'd all get together and we'd go to one of the kids' the houses, and the mom would cook for us, and it was all the safeties. Well, I was the only one at the time that was was married, and not only was I married, I had a I had a kid, right? Yeah. So <laughs> in 2006, I'm they're having safety night, and and uh i'm i'm starting to not show on these thursday nights and and they're not having it and so you know wake up friday morning to my house uh my little you know three bedroom house that was toilet papered and uh <laughs> and and they're and these guys are denying that they're toilet paper in my house of course and and uh you know i ended up getting them back by stealing their pumpkins and carving 28 in, in their pumpkins one time but <laughs> It's just the, you know the guy these these memories with with those with my uh, those teammates and the safeties and you know 2007 was 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 a fun year obviously that, that UCLA game was was a fun one right after um, Bob Rice had died and and we were you know we we're kind of all kind of going through that process how big he was for the program he ended up he was also a guy that was close to me and he married my wife and I and oh, wow. it was a special game yeah yeah Did Bob Rice was a, yeah so he married my wife and I I, uh, I grew up. Uh, next to the rice family. And, and so that was a special game beating, beating that top ranked, uh, UCLA team at home. Um, I think Ben Olson was their quarterback and he was hyped up. Right. And, and uh, and we just, uh, he was, you know, after that game, he was never the same, you know, with all the sacks that he took that game, the hits that we, we put on him. Uh, he just never seemed to be the same quarterback after that. So, uh, yeah, a lot of, a lot of great memories and, uh, that I have, um, you know, I could go on and all day about, about, uh, some of those, uh, those, those memories, but you, you always miss the, you know, you miss the, 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 the locker rooms, you miss those, those moments, uh, that you share in the locker room and, you know, going in and out of that tunnel. And I mean, those are the, those are the things you miss most when I'm, when I'm with my 14 year old, you know, and, and, and watching him play, you know, it's those moments in between the games that, uh, you know, that you, you, you as a dad just, you know, hope your son shares as much as you did. Cause it, it was fun. Those, those rides were a lot of fun. Yeah. Everyone talks about the OA season, 13 wins, Utah, 10 wins again, and 09 and 10 about how that was really, those were the years that got Kyle Winningham off and running, but you forget, uh, you know, sometimes those early years and guys like yourself who helped him and this program get through that transition from Urban Meyer to, to coach Witt and, and the foundation was laid for the run that's continued to this day. And, and some of the big moments that you were a part of in 05, 06, and 07. As I mentioned, you were one of the, the few guys from 07 that did not come back for that 08 season, but you were around that group a lot. You saw those guys grow up from just young guys in the program when you were playing yourself in 04 and 05, a, a redshirt in 04 playing in 05. You were around those guys. You, you knew what they were about. You knew the character of that group. It's one thing to say, hey, for 08, let's go out and win a conference championship, but to go undefeated. And the face number two in the country, those were those are pretty high accomplishments. You know, Steve, as you were around that group, especially in the latter stages of the, of the 07 season, did you see that type of potential? Or were you kind of like, hey, conference championship, yes, but undefeated and, you know, top five ranking, that might be a bit of a reach. What did you think that team was capable of in 2008? <laughs> 
Yeah, no, I mean, I, I think I'd be lying if I, if I thought that, uh, they'd go run the table and beat Alabama. I mean, I, I mean, I knew they were good. I yeah. knew that there was a special team. I, I didn't, you know, I didn't envision it being a, a team like 2004 where they could run the table. I mean, it's just so hard, right? I mean, it's so hard to run the table in, in college football and to do that, especially as, as at the time, what we were at the time, what we were, is we were, you know, an outsider, you know, we weren't supposed to be in that position. You know, we, uh, you know, uh, you know, mountain West team, uh, you know, it's, I just think that the, the, the cards seem to be always stacked against, against us. Now it's changed ultimately when Utah got on the PAC 12, but um, yeah, I think that that season, uh, for that 2008 or yeah, 2018, uh, leading up to that, they did, I mean, they had the starters, they had all the, they had the potential to do it. Um, but running the table, we just knew how hard it was and, and, and the cards had to align perfectly for them to do that. But you saw it. I mean, you saw it and, and, and Brian and having Brian there who played in 2005, played in 2000, you know, red shirted in, in 2006. 2007 getting experience getting hurt but then still having experience i mean as a a, and 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 brian had all the you know qualities he needed for a quarterback to lead that team and and the you know the starters that he had around him the offensive line that he had coming back i mean it it did you know it it did set up for what we thought would be perhaps you know a, a you know conference championship i thought for sure that team would be you know conference champions i'd I, but I, I don't think I ever saw them, you know, running the table. I just, especially with, you didn't know how, how Michigan was going to be, uh, you know, at the time they had, uh, they had, you know, TCU who was good on the schedule, Oregon state who was coming back and, and had a pretty good team as well. So just looking at the schedule as well, you thought now nah, running the table, no, but perhaps, you know, conference champions. Yeah. You know, it was amazing looking back at that 08 team, how much talent there was on the roster. And it had been, it had been built up over the years, but you look at that offense, guys like Freddie Brown, David Reed, Brett Castile, you would go against. You, you talked about Brian Johnson, all the intangibles that that he brought. That the offensive line was very talented, but that defense had nine guys who had a chance to play in the NFL on that 08 team. You were with those guys a lot, and as I said, you could just see the talent building, the athleticism building within the program. You know, as you as you saw these guys come in, and, and you're kind of with that group through their growth and and you're watching this recruiting take off, you know, what was kind of your take on things and your impressions of, of just the growth of the talent and the athleticism in the program at that point? Yeah, I, I think we were starting to see some of the, that, you know, the, I think you're starting to see some of the, the success from the, from, you know, what was our original, the 2004 year. I think, yeah, you know, that 2004 year, uh, even though urban left, uh, it, it put us on the map. And so you're starting to see some of the fruits of the labor that went into the 2004 year, that fiesta bowl year. And, you know, we're getting guys into the program that, you know, guys that had offers from bigger schools that uh, turned them down to come to play at Utah. And, you know, I think, I think that that world in just a brief period of time changed for, for uh, a lot of recruits. And it was suddenly Utah and Boise state were just as attractive as a lower lower tier Pac-12 school, or more attractive uh, than those lower tier mid tier Pac-12 schools, because of the opportunity that we had to be an outsider and yet still make a BCS bowl game at the time, uh, I think it, it really changed recruiting for a short period of time. I don't think it's it's I don't think it'll go back to that way. But uh, for a little period of time, there was some in some ways you could argue Utah and Boise state had a little bit of a recruiting advantage for those kids that were not necessarily your top, top recruits that, you know, perhaps you were never going to get anyways, but you were now getting these guys that had offers from Cal, you had offers from Oregon state, you had, uh, you know, Arizona, but they decided to turn them down and come to Utah because of what Utah, you know, could accomplish not only, you know, for the recognition, but also an opportunity to go play for potential national championship, you know, national championship. So, uh, I, yeah, I think you started to see that that trickle down effect uh, from, you know, the, that Fiesta Bowl year. And, it, and ultimately, you know, it took four years for some of those, those recruits to get that experience. And and uh, and I think that's exactly why a four year book when you factor in a red shirt, you know, that kind of exactly where they they should have landed in 2008. 
Yeah, you're right. And football does take time to get those kids in, develop them. But I talked to Robert Johnson a few weeks ago, and he was not recruited by UCLA. And there were a lot of guys like him who were ignored by Pac-12, then Pac-10 programs. You had guys that had a chance to maybe go play someplace, but Utah said, hey, you can come in and play right away and make an impact. And we went to the Fiesta Bowl in 04. There's no reason why we can't do it again. So you're right. There were a lot of guys who were ignored by the bigger programs or, or had a better chance at Utah who came in and it worked out really well for him, as we mentioned. The East going uh, undefeated in 2008 and 10 win seasons in 9 and 10 as well. Visiting with Steve Tate here on Utes Insider, presented by Pepsi. Grab a Pepsi and some friends and get in the game. Pepsi, proud partner of University of Utah Athletics. Well, Steve, your, your career wraps up. You had to be a spectator, unfortunately, for that 08 season, but you were a guy who uh, has, has been around the program for a lot. And I know when you graduated, you had a degree in economics. Where did your life take you after you finish your Utah career you know so I got done and you know I, I I always I always felt one I was I was 25 at the time trying to you know pursue my dream in the NFL and I got uh, invited to the Hula Bowl as one of the top safeties and you know I, I think I was ranked you know right there at number 20 or so that's top safeties in the country and and ultimately if you looked at you know where those you know where the top 20 safety lands you I thought I'd be a late round pick uh anywhere from fifth to seventh round or, uh, or a free agent. And, um, uh, but you know, at the time my mindset, I, my wife at the time we were, she was nine months pregnant. So we were just ready to have our daughter. Yeah. Um, we had my son, Bo, who was two at the time, you know, I, I had a different perspective on life where I, I, I thought, you know, if, if football, if this is where football takes me and I be, you know, I, and I can look back and say, I was an all conference safety three year starter at Utah and a captain. I mean, how, how great is that to, to reflect back on? So I, I was pretty satisfied with, you know, what I had accomplished. I, I didn't have to, you know, I didn't, I didn't have this need to prove anybody else or do anybody any favors at this time. And I kind of went into that whole NFL phase with the you know, notion that if, if, it, if this is a, far, I'm going to take football as far as it takes me and I'm not going to push it any further. And, you know, when I got the opportunity from Tampa Bay, you know, I had, the, I had the discussion with my, with my, uh, my agent at the time. And I said, well, tell me the, tell me the contract and tell me the, uh, the money. And he said, there's no money. There's no contract. And for me, it was like, that's it. That's what I needed to know. <laughs> yeah. You know, I mean, I was like, I, I have a son, I've got a daughter and, uh, I got to start putting them first. And, you know, it, it, oddly enough, you kind of go through this, uh, somewhat of a guilt phase as a dad, you know, where you look at your wife and she's going to work and putting, you know, food on the table for you to go live your, your dream. You know, I mean, it's like the ultimate uncle Rico story. And yeah. <laughs> so I, I, in some ways I, I just didn't feel good about it. And I, I just felt like it was time for me to be a dad. It was time for me to provide for the family. And, and that phase of life of playing football was amazing. And, uh, but I, you know, I didn't want to start putting my family through unnecessary, you know, uh, moving and, uh, perhaps hardships, just so I could live out my dream. So at the time, uh, when, you know, I basically called it quits, I got an opportunity, uh, you know, uh, uh, an opportunity to go, uh, be in the pharmaceutical sales industry. And it took me, took us to Oregon. So we up moved to Oregon, um, in 2000, you know, this is 2007, uh, at, I guess 2008, right after, so right after my 2008, that's 2007 or 2008, uh, bought a home in Oregon, worst time you could buy a home and, <laughs> and, uh, moved up there and, and did it for a year. And, you know, you go through, you go through this, you, you almost go through this identity crisis when you get done playing. Right. And, and more so when you're in Oregon where nobody knows you and you don't have friends and, you know, your name is no, no longer, you know, does has no uh, appeal to it where in Utah it still has some appeal to it and you can use that to network. And so I'm up in Oregon and just hating it, just despising it. And I remember I was only a month into it. I didn't love my job. I'm, I didn't love living up there. And I I'm on the internet looking at jobs in Utah and my wife's like, what are you doing? We had just bought our house and yeah. you know, I just, I was not happy. And so nine months later, I think it was only 10 months later after we bought our house, you know, I put it on, on the market for sale by owner in 2008, you know, and, uh, sure enough, I don't know how it sold, but we sold it and got back to Utah. And, uh, 
I made a call to uh, a guy named Terry Preston. You know, oh, yeah. No Terry. No yeah. Terry well. <laughs> and uh, in fact, I didn't make a call. I, I blindly guessed his email address. Uh, I, <laughs> yeah, somebody had said he worked for Boston Scientific, and I wanted to, I wanted to get in the medical device field. I wanted to be a part of that. And so I, I guessed his email. Just I, I, I knew somebody had Boston and how their email was formatted. So I yeah. just guessed his, his email was the same. And so I shot him a random email and said, I'll do whatever you you know, whatever you need, but I, I want to get into this field that you're in. And Terry hired me, hired me on the spot, which was unheard of at the time because that industry was so sought after. And, you know, he hired me and, uh, he was, he was a huge, you know, uh, supporter of mine and a, a guy that, uh, still big influence in my life, a guy I respect so well, but you know, it, it was amazing what, what Utah ties do for you, you know? Yeah. And, uh, I love Terry and his family, what they were able to do for me. So I, I, I worked with Terry, uh, for about, uh, I think it's four or five years. And, uh, and then, um, you know, got in that space and yeah, you know, I felt one of those things where I, I, I looked around and I loved this and I said, do I want to be doing this when I'm 55, 60 years old? I said, it's a fun job now, but is this something I really want to be doing when I'm, you know, in my late fifties and sixties and ultimately said no. And, decided to go get my series seven on a whim and studied on my, on my own. I just, uh, you know, came home every day from my work every night, studied for a series seven and ended up getting my series seven and, uh, and joining my dad and his, in this, in this field and, uh, building my own kind of clientele. And so, and, uh, ultimately that's led me where I'm at now. And now I bought my dad out. He's retired. And so I run, I run this practice. Well, very good. I got to know Terry well when he worked for the Crimson Club, so I missed his, or at least most of his playing career, but got to know Terry when he worked for the Crimson Club, and a great guy who's done very well, and you know, hearing you talk about the transition from your playing days to the professional world, I know a lot of athletes go through that, where all of a sudden, it's a different world, it's a different environment, and, and you go from being kind of the big man on campus to an unknown, and, and especially for guys trying to make that transition to a pro career, you know, if you're if you're not married coming out of college and you can say, I can do this for a few years and, and you kind of get through it. But it, in your stage, you were married, you had uh, one child already, another one coming. It's hard to, to tell your wife, Hey, you need to sacrifice some more while I go after this. And, and it sounds like it worked out very well for you to make the decisions you did and, and uh, head to Oregon and come back. And, and you've done very well for yourself in the business world here. Steve, I want to talk to you about something else. It's, it's very personal and, and some people go through tragedy and they keep it very private and it's understandable that they do because it's, it's tough. But, uh, you and your wife, uh, went through a, a very, uh, tough, tough situation. It's, it's kind of the, the worst nightmare for, for any parents, you and Savannah, uh, back in 2015, you had triplets and, and, uh, one of those triplets of, of Heath and Reese and Hayes, uh, Hayes had a, a brain tumor, about a third of the size of his brain that was found on, on January 7th of, of 16. And, and, uh, he was less than a year old. And I know it was such a hard, hard time for you and your family. Uh, some people know the story, some don't, and, and, and I couldn't do it justice. So if, if you don't mind, Steve, just kind of walk us through, you know, that process for your family, the, the emotions you went through, the thoughts you went through and, and that tough, tough stretch as you tried to help your son Hayes, uh, battle childhood cancer. Yeah. I mean, it was, you know, it's certainly the most devastating news a parent, you know, could ever receive. And, you know, we found ourselves, uh, just, you know, turning to God, turning to our community, uh, you know, doing whatever we, whatever it took to, to go through this and survive and, and get our son healthy. You know, that was ultimately the goal. And, you know, at the time when it got the diagnosis, it rocked my world. I mean, it, I, I, I didn't know how to handle it. I didn't know, you know, I didn't know the right protocol, you know, there's no, there's no right or wrong way to handle that, uh, that news that your son has brain cancer. And in my life had never been private. Um, just because of my football days, both at high school and in college, you know, my, my life was kind of out there and, um, and I, you know, I, I didn't, it, oddly enough, it was one of those things where the support felt so good from people. And, and then, you know, Hayes at the time, you know, I just felt like, I, I just seeing him go through this was one of those things where I wanted to share with the world and wanted to, you know, put his face out there in the world. And, and one, just to, just because I was, I'm so proud. I was so proud of the dad to see him going through this and yet still smiling. And, and so he was, he was, you know, one that 
was was an inspiration to me and, and I found that he was an inspiration to people all over the world and you know that support went both ways I think people saw him as a huge inspiration and then you know this community with that was there lifting us up um, through these hard times uh, through the times of when we found out the news and you know going through the the chemotherapy you know phase and and uh, the stem cell transplant phase and you know, I think the community, uh, you know, the University of Utah, you know, the coaches, I mean, everyone, BYU, Utah, I mean, it, it just felt like there were no longer rivals in this situation. There were no longer, you know, it was no longer Utah versus BYU. It was just humanity. And it felt so good. And, and it was one that just really helped our family. And so I, I think when I when we kind of went public with it, I, I'm not sure it was if it was by choice or just that it just happened to to, to pan out that way. But you know, it, it looking back, I'm I'm glad I did. I'm glad um, I still do uh, to a certain extent to, to be able to share with people the world that I lived that I'm going through now as a grieving dad. Um, you know, we're in a we're in a world, especially now, 2020, where there's a lot of people suffering mentally, you know, there's a lot of people going through some hardships, uh, ailments and, uh, you know, it, it, knowing that other people have been through something like that or going through hard times and, and yet coming out on top and standing, I, I think we need more stories of those. And so, you know, I've always felt maybe it's that, that, that kind of leader in me, that captain that I, I always felt that like, you know, this is a time to, to really show your skills, show your leadership qualities and, and be a, a leader for a community and, and, you know, help, uh, you know, a, a current situation right now in childhood cancer, that's completely underfunded and not getting attention. And so, you know, Hayes, Hayes is that that's his legacy. And, um, you know, our family is grieving. We're, we'll never stop grieving. Grieving is one of those things that just doesn't stop. You know, I don't, unless you've been through it, you don't realize that, but it's, there's no, there's no, you know, off switch for grieving. It's now the world that we live in and how we deal with it. And, um, you know, and we, my wife and I, and our, our kids, we still, you know, have moments of really tough, you know, grieving and, and, uh, and sadness that we experience in darkness. But ultimately, you know, uh, we, we're, we're still here. We're standing, we're thriving as best we can and trying to figure it all out. You know, you see it all the time when people go through, uh, tough things and, and they say, I want to do something. I want to help this experience become something for someone else and you see it especially with parents who have children who go through things how tough that is for them and obviously you need to have as you said a mourning process it really never leaves you but it, it's one thing to have some ideas and say i want to do something it's another to actually do it and and for you and your wife savannah to form the hey stuff foundation uh and and come up with ways to to really raise awareness for childhood cancer and to help others it's it's commendable for what you guys have done you know in the starting process, Steve, with the Hayes Tough Foundation, how did it start? I mean, was it a conversation? Was it some friends coming to you and saying, hey, you know, we know you want to do something. Well, you want to help. How did this foundation that's done so well since since that time you started, how did it get off the ground back in those early days? Yeah, great question. In fact, yeah, it was a conversation. We were, um, at the time, we were kind of celebrating Hayes's, uh remission and at the time we decided to take a trip our family uh, we decided to hell with everything else we're going to go take a trip <laughs> not tell the doctors or nurses and we're going to go down to california and uh experience disney disneyland with Hayes. he loved mickey mouse and so we we road tripped it um and uh on the you know i remember the exact location time where we were driving on the road trip where my wife and I both said, you know, we got to, you got to do something with this. And, you know, it was going to, regardless of what the outcome with Hayes was, it was, we had just seen so much support and, you know, we, we had formed this, this world and so many people were, you know, supporting us that we had kind of gotten this platform and it wasn't one that we, you know, sought after. It was just one that people drew interest in our story um, and so this platform that we got, um, was one that we never figured we'd have. And we were sitting there in the car ride and we said, we gotta, we gotta do a foundation. And at the time our focus was, you know, so Hayes, Hayes didn't qualify for make a wish foundation, uh, because he was too young. Um, they have a criteria that I, I think you have to be, I think it's 
but I think you have to be at least three years old in order to uh, to be able to have a make a wish trip. Okay. And so and so we were taking this trip as our. I mean, we financially I was okay. I mean, that we didn't need the Make a Wish Foundation, so we were kind of doing this trip as our own. We were providing our own Make a Wish Foundation type, or you know, Make a Wish Foundation trip. We were just saying, hey, this is it. Let's go enjoy everything and. And so, you know, as we're making this drive and, you know, we thought how many kids are missing out on this, you know, how many families are missing out on stuff like this? Cause they can't afford it. They can't finance. They're not, you know, in a place financially, they're trying to pay for their bills. And, and yet we were able to do this after even paying for all the medical bills. And so that was kind of our, that was the kind of, uh, the light bulb moment. We said, yeah, we're going to, we're going to do this. We're going to provide this for that unique, you know, person or kids that just don't qualify and then it just, need, I mean, it just evolved. I mean, it, it, it became way more than I thought. We, I thought we could help one family maybe a year, maybe one, one family, and that was it. I and mean, we didn't know where it would go. You know, we, we never envisioned being able to raise millions of dollars. I mean, you know, it's, it's, and we never thought it would be like this where we could help, you know, you know, thousands of, of families. And, um, you know, again, I think that's, I don't think that's just circumstance or coincidence. Coincidence. I think that's certainly a work from, from God, from Hayes. You know, I still think Hayes is a huge part and has a huge part in, in this. And he guides us all the time on people that are in need, um, all the time. And, and so, you know, that's, that's how it came about. And here we are now. Well, it's amazing what you guys have done. And Hayes's legacy has lived on through the Hayes Tough Foundation. You know, Steve, I was checking out your website. I was amazed because cancer has been around, unfortunately, a long time, and, and people talk about their wear, but childhood cancer, I had no idea, was so underfunded. I mean, nearly 100,000 kids die every year from childhood cancer, almost 300 per day, but yet the research for childhood cancer is vastly underfunded. It's way behind AIDS and, and pediatrics and some other things, and, and as you went through that process with Hayes, you became very aware of, of just uh, you know how underfunded and, and how... Um, you know, how little the awareness is of, of childhood cancer and the struggles. And uh, what you guys have done is, is terrific. You have an annual 5K and uh, Dream Ball every summer. The 5K is in the spring. I know it's been tough with uh, the pandemic to continue your normal activities. So uh, and for people who, you know, maybe can't do this or that, but still want to help out your foundation and, and donate and, and continue to help thousands as you and your wife Savannah have and your family, how can they help out in this current day? You know, yeah, that's, uh, we appreciate that. Now, donations, you can go to hayestough.org. Um, you can you can check us out there. We're on Instagram as well, Facebook. Uh, you can go to our individual pages as well where we talk about the foundation at length. Um, and, but, yeah, most, most of that information is found, out, uh, found at hayestough.org. Um, yeah, you know, this year's been hard. You know, needless to say, we, we, it's in a situation where people – you know, it's tough. We're in a, we're in a pandemic. People are being furloughed and it's, it's tough to have, you know, those same donations, uh, that, you know, we've had in 2018, 2019. So we're doing, you know, the best that we can in order to, to fundraise. And it's, it's obviously behind the, the last couple of years, but you know, we, we, we know it'll pick back up and, uh, we know that there's so many generous people out there that are continuing, continuing to lift us up and, you know, miracles happen all the time. And, We've seen it, uh, so you know we continue to put our trust in that. But uh, we're always so appreciative of the people that support us and, and the donations that we get. Well, you and Savannah and your family are doing great things with the Hayes Tough Foundation. Again, check out their website and and uh, hear their story, find out details in their story, and, and and just really learn more about research for childhood cancer. Well, Steve, to kind of change topics here a little bit. Uh, again, you guys are doing tremendous work with your foundation. You know, it's, it's been a rough year in so many respects, as we were talking about, and and to be a college athlete uh, in in this climate is 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 very very difficult. They had a week of spring ball, we had to shut things down. They were sent home from campus and weren't able to train as they normally do in the summer. And and the fall season that we thought might not happen is going to happen, but it's it's going to be a shorter season. It's much later, a different ramp up. You know, if you can't see, put yourself in the position uh, of being a, a college football player in this day and age and just the challenges these, these guys have faced the past nine months or so and, and how you would deal with it if you were in their situation. Yeah, it's, it's fun. I mean, I think you can break it down into almost uh, two, two different attitudes that I'd have. Uh, I mean, once I had proven myself, you know, my, my junior and my sophomore, junior, senior year, after my junior year, uh, I would have been like, great. 
You know, I don't need the spring ball. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's right. Like, you know, the body, the, the toll that it, your body has gone through, especially, you know, with me being leading a team in tackle. I mean, you, you need almost six months to recover. So I felt at times spring ball uh, for those guys that had played that previous season. I, I, at times, I felt like it was almost wearing more on your body than than it should. So I would have welcomed it as a junior or senior However, my sophomore year or my red shirt, uh, my red shirt year, uh, that spring game was everything. I mean, so urban Meyer, you know, when I got there after, after, uh, finally kind of, uh, getting my legs back underneath me and having and entering that spring, uh, 2004 year, um, I was able to, you know, play in that spring game and two interceptions in that spring game and, uh, and, and had quite a bit of tackles in that spring game. And, yeah, I remember after that, it was it was one of those moments that I'll I'll never forget because Urban, I mean you you knew Urban. Uh, Urban played the the he he played the mind games and he was a psychological genius and he knew how to motivate people. Yep. And he had a way to do it and he did it with certain individ he did he did things with certain individuals and certain players that he couldn't do with others. He knew he knew the right buttons to push with every person on that team <laughs> and uh, and with mine he kind of knew he kind of knew the underdog card with me and he kind of knew that uh, I didn't like that. I had to be, I had to wait one, you know, one full year for that scholarship to kick in. So he, he would use that as the motivation. And at times he'd be like, you know, act like he doesn't know who I was or whatnot. And uh, after the spring game, he had, you know, I got, he isolated me, stood me up and had the team kind of, you know, uh, give me a, a round of applause for the, the game that I had. And he, you know, he only, he only pointed me out. The only one that that whole entire spring game and, that was it. That's all wow. it took. I mean, yeah, that was, that was all it took is just for urban to acknowledge that and, and have the team stand up and give me a, you know, a, a, you know, a round of applause was, was, was special. And so that was, that was all because of the spring game. You know, I think back then perhaps, and that was the, that was the, 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 the red and white game. So it was obviously leading up to that point that we had tons of other scrimmages as well, but it's, it's huge for those, those kids that are trying to earn a spot, you know, those kids that, Right, right now we're on the border and they're trying to prove themselves. Uh, spring football is big, and so uh, it's 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 going to be a little, little bit of a learning curve, you know. Uh, I, I think with Utah having to replace so many people. Now, fortunately, the, a lot of most of the people they have to replace is on defense, but you know, I I, I think that uh, you know, fortunately for them, it's not like you know other teams had spring ball, so everyone's in the same position. But it's harder for those teams that are that are trying to you know rebound and you know, refill some of those positions that that were left. Um, uh, you know, I think that's 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 going to be the biggest task. Um, but again, everyone's in that same boat. Uh, whether that you know whether that makes them feel warm and fuzzy or not, I doubt it. You know, I think everyone's <laughs> probably just trying to deal with the situation. But it, it, it will be a little. It'll be interesting for the youths. Uh, but. Again, uh, the talent that I think this team has, uh, despite the newcomers that don't have experience, there's so much talent on this team that I think they're going to be fine overcoming it. Coach Witt has so much, you know, the experience he has as a coach and that staff. I mean, that, that, you know, that gives every bit of Utah an advantage to go, you know, make some, some, some big moves and, you know, this, this season. You know, there was so much conversation about spring football in 21, and, and Mark Carlin, our AD, said, you know, it's really a non-starter. It was his assessment of spring football originally when the fall looked like it could happen. Then we find out the fall is not going to happen, and they thought, well, we either try the spring or else we go, you know, 20-some months without football. And I talked to Yogi Roth on this podcast. He said, you know what, 10 games is too much, 6 or 8 are maybe doable, and you maybe kind of look at it as – more of a developmental spring where you have some games, you play some of your your younger guys, like you mentioned, you normally would in the spring, and at least you get something in. But it worked out well. You know, three of the Power Five conferences went on with uh, the start of the season earlier. The Big Ten Pat 12 coming online. Uh, the Pat 12 will have seven games. But, Steve, another question before we move on is just the mental side of this. You mentioned it as uh, a more experienced player having – you know, some time off in the spring and the shorter fall is good, but just mentally to, to go from thinking, okay, we're, we're not having a spring summer is different. Fall's going to be starting, but later, and then there's no fall. Then there's a fall coming, uh, in a few weeks here from a mental standpoint, how challenging would the, this past stretch of time be for these kids? Oh man. Yeah. It, it incredibly challenging. I mean, these, the, you got to remember they're still, you know, they're still young kids, 18, 19, 
you know, 2021. 20, I mean, these, these kids are young yeah. and, uh, and we're all struggling, you know, I think we're all trying to figure out this year and, you know, I, you feel for these kids, a lot of these kids couldn't go home during this pandemic or, or you know, they, they, they remained in their, in, in, in their dorms. And, you know, I think that creates uh, a huge, you know, uh, mental scare for these kids trying to deal with it. It's tough. I mean, being, I will say being a, a student athlete, I think, I think the misconception for people out there is they all assume that it's all rosy and, and uh, you know, you're, you're the big man on campus. It's, that's not the case at all. I mean, it, you struggle, uh, you struggle with having to deal with the, you know, not, not only your school schedule, but then uh, the, the, the schedule that you've got to carry that, you know, has to do with film that has to do with, you know, nutrition. I mean, it's, 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 it is more than people realize. And these student athletes, they, they, they struggle as it is mentally. And that's why, you know, mental strength coaches have been huge these last few years and, and probably more so now after all this, but mentally uh, I think is it's, it's gotta be taxing for these kids. I'm sure for them to finally get back and have some normalcy to be able to see their coaches uh, because a lot of the kids are away from their family, you know, and, and I think we can all agree during this pandemic, that's one thing we've realized is, you know, there's nothing greater than having your family close by. And a lot of these kids, you know, didn't have that. So, uh, yeah, I think that's a huge hurdle and, and, and I'm hope, you know, I'm hopeful that these kids been able to get through it and, and maybe this, this season with this normalcy will help them kind of get through some of this, but I'm sure a lot of those, those kids are struggling. Yeah. It's been hard for everyone, as you mentioned, and, uh, especially when you're at a young age away from home, it can be especially tough visiting with former all conference safety, Steve Tate, who played for the youth from 05 to 07 today's show being brought to you by university of Utah health with 16 convenient neighborhood health centers. We have a game plan for your family's health. Visit U of U org. Well, Steve, before I let you go, one more question. You're one of the few guys you really spanned the 04 and the 08 seasons. You registered in 04. You didn't play, but you were around that group. And really the core group of that 08 team played with you 05, 06, 07. So you of all people probably have one of the better perspectives to compare 04 and 08. And one of the things about this pandemic is we've had a lot of time to sit around <laughs> and talk about the old days and reminisce and and tell stories and have opinions. So I got to get your opinion before I let you go. Which was the better Utah team, 2004 or 2008, and why? 2004. Okay. Yep. The 2004. Um, you know, it, it's and, and unless you were part of that 2004 team, the it, the uniqueness, the this. I mean, it was just every you you almost knew every every every, every game going into it that we were just going to kill the teams. I mean, it it just had this special feel to it. And, and, you know, urban came back and talked to us as we were put into the the hall of fame, that team. And, and he reflected back and he says, I reflected back on that, on that team. And, you know, we would have beat anybody. We would have been national champs. He says, "I, I don't know if I've had a team like that. And, you know, that's, that's high praise coming from urban, but as a player seeing it and being a part of, I mean, it was, it was evident. It was evident that, uh, that, not only do we have the talent, but we had that, that mental component that nobody was going to come close to us. I mean, our closest game was, was air force that year. I think it was within 14 and uh, you know, that was as close as it got. And that wasn't even a really close game. Um, the final score indicated 14 points, but it, it was just one of those things where, you know, mentally and just the leaders of that team, what they had gone through in uh, the prior year, what they had been through with, with their last couple of years under, uh, under coach Mack. I mean, it, it was a team that was just destined and had everything you needed to win. You had the leadership, you had the NFL talent and you had the coach and, and it, it kind of just was that special. Now that's not, you know, discounting 2008, uh, 2008 was a special year as well. I mean, they overcame some really close win or, you know, overcame some, potential close losses and it was special that that Alabama game was was so special yeah um so but I I think comparing the two I just think that 2014 was one of those it was a machine it was just one of those things it was just a machine we knew every game going into it that it wasn't even going to be close yeah it's been fun conversation this summer I was closer to the 08 team as the broadcaster I worked a little bit with football in in 2004 but to me they were a little bit different you know 
when you do something once and your coach and Urban Meyer leaves, people can kind of discount what you did and say, well, was that just a, a fluke in 04 to do it in 08? The second time in, in five years, I thought legitimized the Utah football yeah. program and the Pat 12 came calling within a couple years after that. But I tell you what, the, the run up to that 04 season and to, to see it from game one against AM at Rice Eccles, yeah. the, the thing was just lit. And I tell you what, you're right. Every week it was anticipation, the thought, hey, we can go out and dominate again. It didn't matter who you were playing, and they had game day come. But that BYU game on November 20th, I never thought I'd see the day that college football game day would come to Salt Lake City for the Utes. Not someone we were playing, but for the Utes. And to watch that thing unfold, it, it was just a special run that, that really not only transformed the Utah football program, but really Utah athletics. I mean, we had been a great basketball school with the Final Four in 98 under Rick Majerus and and to see the football program take off at a time when football was, was becoming paramount in terms of the, the money could be generated and visibility for not just your athletics program, but an entire campus. The timing was perfect. We had the right people in the right place. And, and you know, to me, they're, 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 almost, they're almost different scenarios, but that 04 team and that run was so special. Uh, Steve, I appreciate your, your insight and, and uh, you taking the time to come on. You know, Frank Dolce was always a guy who liked to have a little fun, as you know, and we – did the radio broadcast and he always called you Steve little man Tate. And, and uh, <laughs> <laughs> we all know Frank and, and I love him to death, but uh, you know what? The, look, I tell you, Steve, there's nothing little about you in terms of your playing career, what you've done professionally, your foundation, the Hayes tough foundation, what you've done to create awareness for, for childhood cancer, the money you've raised the thousands of you and your family have helped. Uh, you've had a, a tremendous impact on this community and uh, keep it going. Uh, great catching up with you, and, and Steve, all the best to you and your family. All right. Hey, Mike, uh, thanks for having me on, and as always, go Utes. Thank you very much. Steve Tate, former all conversation safety for the Utes, back to wrap things up in just a moment. For more on Utah athletics, including up-to-date schedules and ticket information, log on to utahutes.com. Now back to more of Utes Insider presented by Pepsi. A lot of fun to catch up with Steve, just a great all-around guy. I had a chance to cover him as a player in his last season in 2007. He came back after working in Oregon for a bit and did some fill-in work as a sideline reporter for us in the 2009 season and, and just a great guy. And and uh, what a great career, some some fun memories he relived for us and gave us some big, great background on, on what it was like to play for Urban Meyer and and uh, to be around Kyle Winningham in his early days as the head coach. But again, the work he and his wife Savannah and that family has done with the Hayes Tough Foundation. You know, I was amazed to read 20 times more children are diagnosed with cancer than pediatric AIDS, yet the U.S. spends 30 times more our pediatric AIDS research than cancer. So, you know, people think, you know, cancer has been around for a long time. There's a lot of awareness. Well, in some cases there, there's not. And, and uh, the Hayes Tough Foundation that Steve and Savannah have going, uh, really working to help raise money to support families, to also help raise money for research and awareness. And they've done a great job against the Hayes Tough Foundation. Uh, check them out. Unfortunately, as we talked about at the end with the, uh, the situation with the pandemic related to the coronavirus. Their normal activities, the 5K, and also their dream ball they have in the fall just can't happen this year. But if you want to help them out, you can make a donation. Again, check it out, the Hayes Tough Foundation. Fun to catch up with Steve Tate, former law conference safety for the Utes here on Utes Insider, presented by Pepsi and University of Utah Health. That will do it for our show. Football just around the corner. Enjoy it. Thanks again to Mike Gilliland on the technical side. That will do it for this edition of Utes Insider. I'm Mike Ligeschult. Until next time. So long, everybody. This has been Utes Insider presented by Pepsi. To hear more episodes of this show and other Utah athletics podcasts, search for them on iTunes, Spotify, and YouTube.